Hi everyone. Uh, for our review of the world's religions, uh, we thought we'd start with the religions that come out of India. And uh, the first on that list will be Hinduism. So this uh, presentation is really to provide uh, a general outline of some of the basic ideas in Hinduism. We'll follow this up with a with another video, which will look at, at some of the more specific principles. But for now, uh, this is what we'd like to give you. Hinduism gives us a, a good place to start with uh, our course. Uh, aside from providing a backdrop for Buddhism, from which which you know emerges out of Hinduism. Hinduism also gives us a kind of a model for uh, how reality is seen by a number of the different religions we'll take a look at. Generally, uh, in Hinduism, we find that uh, human beings are, are thought of as living a reality that is illusory and that it's illusory because we've lost our connection with uh, the ultimate divinity and and that then you could say the the goal of religion is to reconnect us with uh, the divine so hinduism operates on that basic premise and you say a lot of religions kind of operate on a very similar premise the basic teachings of Hinduism are derived from uh, a series of sacred scriptures, primarily the Vedas, and then some of the last chapters in the Vedas are referred to as the Upanishads. And this collection of writings or scriptures are uh, in my estimation, in the estimation of not just me, but a lot of people think that these are the oldest spiritual writings uh, in the world. So, you know, we think that they date from about 1500 to 2000 BCE. And although I'm sure that's an approximation. We, if we try to characterize Hinduism generally, we, we could say it's a multifaceted religion, which that means it has a lot of different sides, a lot of different ways to look at it, and that it's capable of including elements from almost all of the other world religions that we'll take a look at. In this regard, we'd say it's an inclusive religion rather than an exclusive religion. If we say inclusive, we just mean that it's open with respect to other teachings and, uh, and exclusive is usually a kind of closed point of view with respect to other religions. So if you were in a religion that presented itself as being the one true religion, you'd say that's more of an exclusive point of view. Hinduism tends to be open and willing to include other perspectives and uh, let me just take it from there. Well, one of the first things we'd say about any religion, we try to characterize it as either monotheistic or polytheistic. And uh, Hinduism in this respect is, uh, I don't know, I think unique amongst uh, the other religions in that in some respect it's monotheistic, in other respect it's polytheistic. So it's hard to to pinpoint it as one or the other, that in some sense Hinduism seems to be both. We'll look at the different senses, how that might be the case. If we consider how Hinduism might be viewed as monotheistic, well, we could note that, that in general, the ultimate principle of reality in Hinduism is called Brahman. Uh, or we might say 
you might just substitute God for that or the divine or the highest level of reality. Beyond Brahman, there is also what is called Atman. And Atman is a term used for an individual human soul, uh, which is like the our true selves in a way. And that Atman can be thought of as a representative of the divine in an individual person. So you'd say Atman refers to uh, the God that is within each of us. So you have Brahman and Atman, and apparently at least they, they look like they're separate. Brahman is uh, kind of over and against, and then our own individuality is always thought of as Atman. Even though they appear to be separate in this regard, that ultimately the belief is that the two are one and the same thing, that there's really no distinction between Brahman and Atman, there's just one reality. But this idea that they're one and the same can only be realized or recognized or seen when one attains a state of enlightenment. Then one recognizes that uh, this distinction between me and everything else is, uh, is an, an illusory thinking. Uh, Hindus have this saying that sums this up as that art thou. If we look at Hinduism from a, a polytheistic point of view, it seems pretty clear just from a, a cursory glance that the, there are many gods and goddesses, demons and spirits I mean, that are uh, a part of Hindu religion. Actually, there are more than it's possible to count even, so we say thousands and thousands of gods and goddesses and spirits. Uh, that doesn't mean they're all equal in terms of importance. There is a, a kind of hierarchy of those which are more significant, and the three most significant are referred to as uh, the Trimurti, uh, a kind of Hindu trinity, you might say. And that includes Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahma. It could be said that these three gods represent the three necessary forces that uh, you need to explain what we experience about reality. I mean, there seems like there would have to be a force which accounts for things coming into existence, creation, and we say that's that's Brahma. And there also has to be a force or a God which is responsible for taking things out of existence, you say death and destruction, so that would be Shiva. And then a force which is responsible for maintaining a kind of balance between Brahma and Shiva, between creation and destruction, and that would be Vishnu. So Vishnu is responsible for maintaining the harmony that exists in reality. Uh, we can take a, a closer look at uh, some of the images related to these. This is a depiction of Brahma. Uh, he is, as uh, the creator, is, is probably the most important uh, of the, the Trinity. Uh, it's, his kind of body is gilded gold here, it looks like. You can't see all of the heads, but I think uh, ordinarily Brahma would have four heads. And supposedly, legends have it that uh, there's a head for each of the four Vedas that Hindus uh, use as the basis for their religious teaching. 
So even though he might be thought of as the most important, he's not usually picked out as a, a god for individual worship so, more, so much. I mean, we'll look at those that are. Well, here we have a, a statue of Shiva, and uh, a little different than the other images we've looked at, uh, but still, you know, in keeping with the, the style of artwork and, and Hindu, and Hindu, representing Hindu figures. Here, Shiva, we've already said that Shiva represents uh, the destructive forces, death or destruction, the end of things. But in this statue, we see that it looks like Shiva's doing more than just uh, accounting for destruction. We see that he's clearly engaged in a graceful and balanced dance. And, uh, and that this dance seems to serve the function of preserving things as time goes forward because this ring that encircles him is uh, it represents a ring of fire, and I think in his uh, his left hand here, you can see that he's holding a flame, which reinforces the fire motif. And fire is a, a symbol for for the passage of time and how things are always changing in time. Yet Shiva's dance seems to maintain something, and it seems that his uh, his right foot is planted on top of uh, a demon figure which i think has to represent uh you know the untamed or wilder aspects of our natures and somehow shiva's found a way to to keep all of that under control and balanced it's a it's a very beautiful and graceful statue and then here we have uh, a representation of Vishnu. Why Vishnu is blue, I couldn't say, but uh, he he does serve the function, typically, of being the preserver, the one who maintains the balance between good and evil in the the world. There's a a lot of sim symbols involved in this representation, and I I don't know. Uh, how to interpret them, but I'll just draw your attention to them. And most of the imagery that we see in Hindu art sort of has a, a lot of symbolism involved in it if uh, we learn how to to read it. Vishnu, as uh, the preserver, takes human form sometimes to to make sure that uh, affairs on the earth turn out the way that they're supposed to turn out. So when you have big troubles or uh, or moments in history when it looks like things could dramatically go downhill, Shiva will appear in a particular uh, reincarnation of himself to ensure that uh, that things are kept together. Uh, this is one of the uh, avatars of Vishnu or reincarnations of Vishnu. One of the, the forms that Vishnu took uh, in order to descend to the earth and make sure that things worked out a certain way and he took the form of Krishna. Krishna is a again a, another popular deity that people might choose to to focus their worship on. It's not uncommon in Hinduism for individual people or communities, I mean, to focus on a particular deity and for the sake of their worship. This is, they pick a kind of Ishta, Divata, I think it's called. And it, and they might have a little shrine in their house with a, a picture or a statue of the the deity that they're they're focused on. It's not that they believe that the that particular deity is the the sole one and uh, only 
God. I mean, they, they recognize that all these deities represent like aspects of the one ultimate divinity, Brahman. But uh, Krishna is uh, Krishna and Shiva so far that we've looked at are favorites for people to, to focus their devotion on. It's kind of like you have to have uh, an image that's relatable uh, to in order to to focus your love and devotion to it. The the story of Krishna is uh, laid out in a book called the, the Mahabharata, which is uh, one of the major epic poems uh, in India, uh, in Hindu in Hinduism. There's two two poems like that. It's the Mahabharata is one. The second one's the Ramayana. These two epic poems kind of are similar to uh, if we think about the ancient Greeks, they had their Iliad and the Odyssey, which every Greek would have been familiar with. And uh, supposedly those Greek epic poems were written by Homer. In in Hinduism, Hindus have their Mahabharata and the Ramayana, both of which were supposedly written by Vyasa. But just as the, all the Greeks would have known all the stories in their epic poems, Hindus are familiar from their earliest days with the stories of the Mahabharata and the, the Ramayana and all the, the different aspects of those stories would be fixed in their memories. So Krishna plays a, a major role in this story of the Mahabharata. This is another of the, the colorful gods within Hinduism. This is Ganesha. Ganesha doesn't have uh, the elevated status of uh, Vishnu or, or Shiva or Brahma, but he's still a very popular uh, deity. And so, you know, if you went to uh, to a Hindu family's home, there's a good chance you would see a, a picture or a statue of Ganesha in their entryways. I mean, Ganesha is thought to be kind of good luck and somehow helps remove obstacles for people, obstacles to what they want. His origins is, are kind of funny. I mean, it is, Ganesha is supposed to be the, the son of Shiva. Uh, all the gods and goddesses are all paired up in Hinduism. So you have uh, male gods with their consorts. And so Shiva's consort was uh, Parvati. And apparently they lived in a cave high in the mountains. And... Uh, and one day, Shiva wanted to go out hunting, so he left his wife and went off to, to go hunting. And while he was gone, Pravate gave birth to Ganesha and gave birth, you know, and he was born fully formed, a fully formed adult. So, I mean, that kind of thing happens in Hindu mythology, sort of uh, wondrous, miraculous, uh, kind of crazy things. But anyhow, Ganesha was a fully formed young man when he was born, and uh, Parvati, at a certain point, wanted to take a bath, so she asked her son Ganesha to guard the door so that nobody would come and disturb her while she was bathing which Ganesha did. So naturally, while Ganesha is guarding the door, Shiva returns home. And Shiva uh, finds his doorway blocked by this young man that he, he doesn't recognize and who won't let him into the, the cave. And Shiva, in a rage, uh, takes out his sword and cuts off Ganesha's head. Uh, when and then you know Parvati comes out and says, "What have you done? You've killed our son." And uh, and Shiva is filled with remorse and he says, "Oh, I'll fix it," you know. And he runs off 
into the forest and he, he finds, uh, the, grabs the first head that he can find, which is the head of an elephant. He comes back and he puts it on Ganesha's head and then say ever after Ganesha had the head of an elephant. So those kinds of stories are amusing, but they're also colorful, you know, and kind of interesting and a kind of alternative to our own mythologies. Another colorful uh, divinity in Hinduism is Hanuman. Hanuman's called the, the Monkey King, and he's uh, described in the, the epic poem, the Ramayana. Uh, Hanuman is, uh, also has a mythological or symbolic story, I mean, which again is, is so unusual for, from the kinds of stories we get in our own mythology. Supposedly, Hanuman originally was like a statue, a stone monkey, and who was worked on by the forces of nature and finally sort of came to life to be a, a living monkey creature with sort of superpowers. In Hanuman read all the available scriptures and magic spells and so forth, and eventually became so powerful that he uh, challenged heaven and sort of took his, his armies to heaven to try and overcome heaven. And he almost succeeded, except that the last minute the, the gods all united and defeated him and then buried him under a mountain. I think that's probably the mountain he's holding in his hand. And he stayed there for many long, long years. And then finally, he was offered a chance of, uh, of freedom if he would serve people in a more positive way, which he agreed to. So in the story of the Ramayana, uh, Hanuman is a, a loyal friend and companion for Rama. Uh, the king and helps Rama uh, achieve his goals. So he continues to be a popular. Uh, here's another uh, image of Krishna. Uh, in here, this is a statue, and a couple of things stand out. I mean, first of all, just like the the statue of uh, Shiva, we see Krishna dancing. There's a kind of lightness, you know, and sort of a, that is indicated with that. Also, we see that he's naked and exposed. And so we say, again, that's not something you would expect to see in a, a religious figure in Western traditions. You know, it says something about the, the attitude towards the human body and a kind of openness within Hinduism, which is able to include, you know, all aspects of a human being. Where it looks like a, a lot of the Western traditions kind of uh, see certain aspects of a human being as things that sort of uh, we need to overcome or get rid of. So this is uh, another interesting depiction of, of Christian. I've left these two ideas or features of Hinduism uh, to the end here, although they are certainly uh, crucial, I mean, in an understanding of Hinduism and the Hindu religion. So that's the, the idea of karma and the idea of reincarnation. Karma, everyone is, you know, has a, a, an understanding of these two terms because they're, you know, through common usage. Karma has to do is the idea that every action that we perform as human beings has a kind of consequence that attaches it itself to us. So you know, say it's kind of a kind of moral cause and effect relationship. So according to karma you, you know, get away with anything in life you might in the short term but the consequences of doing something negative sort of stay with you and ultimately have to be 
uh, atoned for or paid for uh, or you know you have to work off your your bad karma if you accumulated bad karma to yourself and so good karma generally means you know you, that you've lived well and that if you have good karma it seems as though that's connected with good things happening to you if you have bad karma that seems to indicate that uh, bad things are going to happen to you and this is not, you know, usually it's thought that karma determines what will happen to you in your next life. I mean, although karma may be thought of as something which pertains to this life as well. I mean, if actions have consequences, then those consequences stay with us and may affect, you know, what happens to us in, in this life as well. But also, you know, they would determine something about how what your next life is going to be like so reincarnation is the second idea and this is uh, such a powerful idea and distinction between eastern religions and western uh, religious traditions in as we all know in uh, judaism christianity and islam the, the belief is that human beings just have one life and they may have a soul which is immortal but that you just have one life uh, to live and then the rest of your existence will, will be in another realm and you'll either be punished for living well or rewarded, I mean punished for living badly or uh, rewarded for living well sort of in heaven, hell, maybe. But in Hinduism, it's a different idea. So there is the, the feeling that, uh, that human beings have more than one lifetime to live and that the soul or Atman is uh, an immortal entity that sort of goes through many lifetimes. And so, and... And really the, the aim of Hinduism is somehow to, through all, the course of all these lives, or going around and around on the wheel of existence, you know, birth, death, rebirth, life, death, and, and so on, is to, that you have all these different lifetimes to try to get things worked out right. And so you, you go around and around until you figure things out, until you see reality for, for what it really is. And then, you know, the possible, once you become enlightened, then uh, you escape the necessity of uh, having to come back again and go through uh, all the suffering that's associated and struggle that's associated with living. And karma is what kind of determines you know, what the form of your next existence is going to be. So if you're a Hindu, you try to live well in the circumstances that life has provided you. And if you do, you have you can have faith that uh, karma will help determine that you would come back in a better position for, for achieving enlightenment or you've moved up, you know, moved closer to enlightenment, the possibility of enlightenment. Uh, as a result of living well again and again throughout different uh, lifetimes. So that's a, a, a powerful difference. I mean, the, the consequences of those ideas in terms of how people think about life and, uh, and death and so forth in these different cultures is pretty profound.